Trudeau's quest for democratic transition. Um, and um, that's not easy. I'm with Mutasim Ali, uh, and uh, Mutasim is in Arlington, Virginia, but he's from Sudan. And we're going to talk about that here on Think Tech at four o'clock block. A very interesting subject because when you look at some of these countries we've been studying with Project Expedite Justice and uh, you know transitional justice, um, you feel that maybe this could happen anywhere. And I have come to believe that it can happen anywhere. Welcome to the show, Mutasim. Thank you very much, Jay, for having me. So let's talk about Sudan for a minute. We have a little map. Uh, can you kind of place it for us and tell us where the action is and, and where Khartoum, the capital is, and the difference between North and South and um, how, how the country is like shaping up in the region? OK, here's the map. Sure. Wait, um, this is actually uh, the, the, the new map. Um, it, you know, it does show South Sudan at the, at the bottom, which it became an independent state in 2011 uh, after they exercised their um, rights to, to self-determination. And um, right to your question as to what are, where are the actions, right, in Sudan, and unfortunately, I have to say action is, actions are everywhere. Uh, but most importantly, uh, I would have to um, indicate to the Western part um, of the country, which is called Region Darfur. This is where most of the uh, atrocity crimes, uh, and I remember last time I was on the show, we spoke about the atrocity crimes, and primarily we refer to uh, war crimes, crimes against humanity, uh, genocide, and uh, serious human rights abuses. Uh, then um, in the southern part, which is a little upper than uh, South Sudan, we have um, an area we call the two areas. Uh, we refer to regions of South Kordofan and Blue Nile. These regions are still um, you know, not in peace, um, human rights violations uh, continue to happen, um, though not an extent as in the uh, former regime of the, the former president, Omar Bashir, who is now in the custody of the Sudanese government. Uh, but that's um, another region that we uh, should, um, you know, highlight. Uh, again, because of the crimes, human rights violations in that region. Then we have the Eastern part where uh, recently a lot of people are speaking about the blockade. Uh, and that's in the Eastern part of Sudan, you know, definitely will, will elaborate a little more. Um, uh, but, but that's like another region to look at. And I think the importance of looking at the Eastern part of Sudan because it's sort of neighbors um, two um, countries, uh, one Eritrea, we know Eritrea is one of the most oppressive regimes in the world, uh, it's a man, uh, one man show country, uh, it's, you know, most of the Eritreans knew only one president who is still in power until today. Uh, and then uh, below Eritrea, we have Ethiopia, which is also, you have the Tigray region, uh, also, we, we, you know, uh, Tigray region has also uh, came up um, uh, as you know, uh, because of the atrocities that are being committed. Um, and um, some experts even suggest that there is a genocide uh, in the Tigray region. Uh, this is yet to be proved, but in any event, it is a very um, uh, turbulent region. Uh, and then we have um, Khartoum. This is where, you know, everything happens in terms of um, uh, political leadership and power and uh, decision-making uh, center. Um, and so, so this is more or less of, uh, you know, about the, the map of Sudan. I, uh, I Googled the news uh, for Sudan this morning, and I wanted to step through some of the, uh, you know, the top headlines. It seems like a lot of things are happening Absolutely. in Sudan right now. Uh, first of all, you mentioned the blockade. So we have a, a blockade uh, on the east there in, uh, a, in, in Sudan's main port 
by protesters, and they are stopping uh, the entry of fuel oil and, and food uh, in that blockade. What's going on in the blockade? Um, and so unfortunately, this is part of the, um, you know, um, political uh, fragility in, in, in Sudan. Um, uh, you know, ever since the removal of the former regime, uh, people continue to protest, um, some for uh, basic, um, you know, needs, um, food prices, uh, fuel, um, and all of that, and others have political demands as in the Eastern Sudan. Um, and um, some experts suggest that the, the protest in Eastern Sudan is ignited by the um, military uh, leaders in Sudan to delegitimize the efforts of the civilian, um, of the civilian leaders. Uh, and to say that civilian leaders have failed to address the concerns of the Sudanese people. And as such, uh, the cabinet should be dissolved and formed uh, and form a new cabinet that is more inclusive. Uh, but I think this is um, an argument that be used by military leaders often to, um, you know, to strengthen their grip on power. Uh, and so, and so the, the, the protest in, and the blockade in Eastern Sudan, though they have legitimate demands, yet there are concerns about um, that they are being used by military leaders just to, uh, you know, to strengthen their grip on power. Well, that, that, that all opens uh, Pandora's box because the blockade reflects so much and has uh, so much effect on things, you know. I mean, for example, we have um, port failures in uh, the East Coast and the West Coast now in the United States. That's going to affect supply lines. It is affecting supply lines. Um, and, it, you know, it's, uh, I guess it's over labor issues and unavailability of the workforce. Bottom line, though, is that it's going to affect supply lines. And any blockade is going to affect supply lines in Sudan the same way. So if the military leaders are doing this and fomenting the unrest around um, the port, you know, the, the main port for Sudan, they're going to have a supply line issue, and that's going to exacerbate, um, you know, the, uh, you know, the frustration and the, and the, and the risk for the country in government. Absolutely. So you told me before the show about these, uh, these repeated coups all in the past couple of weeks. Uh, so, you know, it's a, it's a sign of instability. Uh, it's a sign of a, you know, fundamental disagreement between government uh, and military. Can you talk about it? Absolutely. I think this is a, a very important event. Um, as Sudan or Sudanese people have uh, sacrificed um, um, just to realize freedom, justice, and peace. And unfortunately, uh, we have uh, in Sudan a long history of military coups. Um, some were successful, including the former regime that was removed by the Sudanese revolution in um, April 2019. Um, but the recent military coup, which was September 21st, it was uh, an effort to uh, undermine the democratic transition. Um, both civilian leaders and military leaders condemned the, um, the attempt, uh, even though um, civilian and military leaders have tremendous um, disagreements um, power sharing and blaming each other, but they they agree that the attempt was endangering the democratic um, transition in Sudan. Um, so the civilian leaders um, think that the the attempted coup was uh, organized by the remnants of the former regime of President Omar Bashir, as they are still in the civil service, there is, um, uh, there is still in the military, intelligence, police. And so that's part of the reason why in Sudan we have, there is a committee called the anti-corruption um, and the um, 
you know, uh, this empowerment committee to remove the elements of the former regime from the government uh, offices. And so uh, this is really a huge concern for many Sudanese people. Uh, the Sudanese people were very hopeful for change, but now they sort of realize the threats um, to the revolutions and to their sacrifices. And they think that the military, I mean, from majority or oh, some Sudanese uh, at least, think that the military uh, leaders who are chairing the first you know, period of the transitional period are not interested in the democratic transition. And as such, they um, create all these events, whether um, security um, concerns or civic unrest to undermine the democratic transition and to say that um, the only way for Sudan to move forward is to for the military to be empowered to ensure security and peace in Sudan. And so this is really a huge concern. And uh, but I, I believe that people will have a say uh, that they will not. Um, I mean, definitely Sudanese people are super determined that there will be no more military rule in Sudan. Mm, hope so. You know, <clears throat> so there's a very interesting uh, parallel a uh, very interesting lesson in all of this is that um, the two lessons that I can see, I was, I'm thinking uh, really like your reaction to it. No, number one lesson is that um, there's an agreement for the transfer of power. Um, that is, uh, and it's a really odd agreement. I've never heard of this before, but here you go. Uh, the military has power by agreement for 21 months, and then it rotates to the civilian government for the next 21 months. Um, and it's supposed to be a peaceful transition from one to the other. Just like, you know, we thought we had in this country, a peaceful, agreeable transition uh, from administration to administration. But if the, you know, the, the, the people in power want to preserve their power, want to stop the um, peaceful transfer of power to the next the next organization, next group that's supposed to take power, like for example, the ones who win the election uh, or in Sudan from the military to the civilians, the one obvious strategy for them is to disrupt things and to um, try to uh, pose, pose blame on the, the group that's supposed to take power and undermine them. And in that, in that way, I suppose uh, the strategy is clear that they want to stop the transition of power from the first to the second. Um, and indeed, uh, you, could, you could find that phenomenon happening here in the United States. But certainly, uh, it's an obvious uh, strategy in Sudan. Your thoughts? Absolutely. So I think you perfectly highlighted this. And we've seen that here in America in you know, January 2020. Um, and, and so, in, in, you know, actually January 2021, uh, this year, uh, but in the case of Sudan, it's even, you know, um, more obvious, right? Uh, because in Sudan, we do not have democratic institutions. Guess what? Um, until today, uh, since the removal of the former regime, Sudan does not have legislative body to hold the executive body accountable, right, to, you know, to maintain, the, you know, the, the, the balance of power, check and balances and all of that. And so this is not the case in Sudan. So you can only imagine how, um, you know, uh, how easy would it be for the, with the military or civilian leaders to remain in power. Um, and so the, the recent events from the civil unrest in the, in, in Eastern Sudan, or the attempted coup or many other events in, in, in Sudan, including some of the you know, terror um, attacks that happened lately in Khartoum, they all indicate that um, there is no interest, at least from the military part, to transform the power to civilians. Here's uh, this. This is not to say that civilians are 
willing to also transform into democracy and lead for free and fair elections, right? Because also politicians, the political parties who are part of the, uh, we call it the political incubator of the, the cabinet, the, 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 the councils of ministers, they seem to be uh, selfish. Um, the, 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 the cabinet is less inclusive, basically, politically speaking. And so that's like another concern by ministers. And so everything indicates that there is no uh, real interest uh, from both military and civilians to move into uh, or to successfully, um, you know, accomplish um, democratic transition. And so that's really- uh, It doesn't bode well, it doesn't bode well. But the second point that comes to my mind anyway, just in this discussion um, is this, is that in, in a democratic society, ideally, you, you have uh, a right to a fair vote, have that. And you have uh, the people who are elected are, are civilians. Uh, they're, you know, the government, so to speak, the civilian government. And uh, in a democratic society, the military works for, responds to, is subordinate to the civilian government. And that's the way it is in the US Constitution. But, you know, questions have been raised about that. And in various places in the world, um, you know, it's not settled that the military should respond to the civilians. It's not settled that the civilians, uh, the representative civilians, the democratically elected civilians should be in charge. Um, and there are people, including people in the United States, who, you know, believe that the military uh, um, should be able to speak out against the civilians uh, and exercise a certain amount of power um, and, um, you know, are not necessarily subordinate uh, into the chain of command, to the commander in chief, so to speak. Um, and I think that uh, just a thought, and I like your reaction, if you don't have this sort of general consensus um, that the military works for the civilian and the civilian works for the people is represented, you know, uh, represented by a vote of the people, then you, you really can't have democracy. Am I right? Absolutely. And this is one of the reasons why when the Sudanese people, um, all the Sudanese people from different parts of Sudan, as we, you know, we, we, we explained earlier, from Darfur, so, uh, the two areas, Bulunan and, and uh, South Kudufan, Eastern Sudan, Northern Sudan, and Khartoum, all the people demanded one thing, civilian rule. And I think that is just a response to, um, you know, to the um, um, tiredness of the Sudanese people, they all to, to the former military rules. And so the idea here is, the military should be subject to civilian uh, leadership. They should be subordinate to civilian, um, you know, uh, leaders in, in the country. And so that's why in the context of the transitional justice in Sudan, we speak of um, one of the key elements, of course, um, is to, um, you know, conduct or undertake, um, you know, institutional reforms. And the idea of institutional reforms is to reform all the um, security uh, sector to make sure that um, the army will not be loyal to individuals, rather to the Sudanese people. The army and the military, all the security sector should not be, um, uh, should not be a political party should not be involved in politics, rather um, a professional um, institution that their sole goal is to protect the land and the people. Um, this is not the case so far. The security uh, or the military institution in Sudan seem to act like a political party. They um, participate in political events. Um, they campaign sometimes, uh, and that's part of the reason why I am worried about, um, you know, the democratic transition in Sudan. Um, and so uh, one of the things that, uh, you know, we recommend is to undertake 
institutional reforms to begin with, uh, and that begins with, um, you know, um, reform in the legal um, military laws, like the, the army law, the police law, and uh, all the other laws that are related to the security sector. And people even say that we need to restructure the entire, you know, um, you know, military institution, right? So as to be inclusive to all Sudanese people, irrespective of their- yeah, but who, would, who would do that, Mutasim? And, you know, if the military is running things right now and in, in charge uh, in their rotation, if you will, um, are they going to agree to that? Um, you know, reform comes hard when uh, the reformers are in charge, or rather the, the ones who oppose reform are in charge. Surely that's a big question. And I, I do think that the Sudanese people are brave enough to push for this. Uh, they were able to remove the former regime from power. Uh, one of the most repressive regimes in the world, a regime of a, um, you know, an authoritarian, authoritarian president, Omar al-Bashir, uh, who committed atrocities in Darfur, in the two areas, Eastern Sudan, pretty much all, you know, in all the country. Uh, they, they were able to remove that regime from power. And I, I believe that these the same P Sudanese people can make that reform. But again, unfortunately, it's not going to be that quick. Will uh, the army go along with it? Will the military go along with these, these reforms? Uh, have they indicated they will? I, I No. So far, um, there seems to be no interest from the military because it does not serve their interest. Uh, the military leaders, they, they tend to act as politicians. And so by restructuring and uh, reforming the, the military institution that would definitely would not be in line with their with their with their interests and, and political um you know mm -hmm. uh, objectives and so uh when sudanese people protested to remove the former regime not that the military wanted to um you know wanted that uh, change but because people's will was uh stronger right than the their desire and so uh they had to remove the former regime and so i i, I believe that um even though the military leaders will not um cope with the demands of the sudanese people for um a total civilian rule and institutional reform but i think uh there is a chance to make it happen because the power is uh the power of the people is um, you know uh, overweight the where does the where does the, where does the uh, trial and conviction of what's his name Bashir who was uh, in the custody now of the International Court uh, in in Amsterdam but, but, you know what is what is the um, how does that affect uh, what you're describing will it help if he is affirmatively prosecuted and convicted and and uh, given a, a sentence uh, will it hurt if he is not. Well, um, I think uh, there seems to be a consensus among the Sudanese people that Bashir uh, must be prosecu uh, prosecuted. Um, this is even, you know, among the military leaders, right? Uh, because in the end, if the Bashir's regime is back again in power, the first people to be in danger are the military leaders. Um, and so there is a consensus um, you know, regarding the prosecution of the Bashir and his, uh, the members of the regime. The disagreement though, is um, regarding the, whether Bashir should be tried in Sudan or extradited to the ICC. On one hand, the military leaders, some of the military leaders think that, uh, you know, it may be appropriate to prosecute him uh, in Sudan uh, and that they, in Sudan, they are, um, independent, um, you know, uh, competent judicial institutions. And so there is no reason to extradite him to the ICC. Whereas uh, others think, I think for, um, you know, because this is the demand of the Sudanese people, particularly the people of, you know, uh, in, in Darfur 
And I think one way to achieve peace is to extradite Bashir to, 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 to the ICC. Yeah. Uh, and so there is like that is split even among the military and civilian leaders. And it does seem like, um, uh, you know, nobody wants to champion the extradition of Bashir to the ICC. Uh, and this is, uh, you know, sort of, it really causes a lot of frustration. Among so you think he'll be tried in, in uh, Darfur, in Sudan? Um, I, I would like to think, uh, well, I mean, uh, it's hard to, to, to tell where will he be tried, but, um, you know, the way I see it, uh, he might not be extradited to the ICC. Um, you know, I follow the news and I analyze the statements of the government officials, particularly the military, because they are in power. They are the ones who to, to, to decide whether to extradite them or not. Um, and they do not seem to be interested in doing so. Um, uh, but there's also, you know, sort of a technical legal aspect to the extradition because Bashir is also being tried for um, the military coup of 1989, which brought him uh, to power back then. And so uh, the question, uh, you know, that people are asking if Bashir is extradited to the ICC, what about the, you know, the, the trial for the coup he conducted in 1989? And so these are really the major questions that are uh, hard to go here and there. But I think for in lasting peace in Sudan, the, you know, the best way is to extradite him um, to the ICC. Um, the Sudanese judicial institutions um, are not competent or independent at this point to prosecute at least senior leaders like Bashir. Would you say there's a resistance not only in, uh, you know, in Sudan, but in other countries, especially in Africa, where there have been, um, you know, atrocities and the like, uh, to to resist uh, the influence, uh, the involvement of international organizations, and to say we can handle it, we can do it here. Uh, yes. We don't need you to come around because you're you're really not from our country. Yes. Uh, is, is that in play here? Yes. Um, this is really, you know, sort of, you know, an argument that we hear all the time that the International Criminal Court uh, primarily focuses on, you know, African leaders, right? Um, and that none of the Western leaders, like, you know, they give example of George W. Bush or Tony Blair, right? None of them were sort of, you know, <laughs> indicted by the ICC. Uh, so, so that's a really a, a, a thing that being raised by many Africans. Um, but I do think that, um, you know, that argument is flawed for many reasons. Uh, number one, um, you know, regardless to whether um, Western leaders were indicted by the ICC or not, the fact is people like Bashir killed hundreds of thousands of people right? Uh, this is number one. Number two, this argument is mostly used by, you know, dictators, right? Like, so the idea is basically to shield, uh, you know, their, 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 their power. And so they, they continue to do so, um, to argue that. Uh, and, th and thirdly, we haven't really seen any African leader who committed atrocities who've been prosecuted by you know, but but their countries. And so uh, if that's not the case, then um, are we calling for, you know, impunity or or what? And so um, in the case of Sudan, I think regardless of what African countries um, think of the ICC, the Sudanese people, particularly the victims of the atrocities in Darfur, um, you know, call for extradition of Bashir to the ICC. And so it is up to the Sudanese people to determine that, but not other countries. As, as it should be. Um, a couple of other things I wanted to ask you about, Mutasim. Um, <clears throat> there's, there's a group, um, let's call them the militia. Uh, the, there were five um, members of the Sudanese uh, intelligence organizations, according to the press, that were shot dead uh, two weeks ago in Sudan um, by the militia. Um, who is the militia? 
Who do they work for? What? Do, how do they play in the in this political environment you've been describing? Yeah. So um, the murder of the uh, intelligence members in Sudan, or um, at least to, uh, to the information that we have so far, um, you know, was carried out by a cell of uh, a group that is loyal to the um, Islamic State uh, organization, the ISIS uh, group. And so um, that's, uh, you know, if, you know, I mean, we, we yet to see evidence for that, but if that's the case, it is a concerning because, um, you know, this is, you know, another attempt to, you know, sort of um, to challenge the democratic transition in Sudan. Um, this is actually, uh, you know, this is not the first time that the members of the intelligence were killed. This is actually the second time in less than a month. Um, and, so, and so it is a terrorist um, cell as the government um, allegates. Um, we, you know, um, we, we, we really do not have um, information to further analyze this, but uh, we will treat it as, you know, the government says. Uh, but 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 yes, that's a really a serious concern. Oh, it's destabilizing, you know, and, and the idea now is to stabilize things, and that's certainly not, you know, doesn't stabilize anything. It destabilizes. And my last question for you is an article I saw about Facebook, about how Facebook had um, recently uh, indicated that it was going to remove propaganda networks which are linked to the military in Sudan. Apparently the military camp here um, has been using Facebook to spread propaganda. And only, uh, when was this happen? Oh, today. Uh, oh. Facebook has taken the military networks down off Facebook. I mean, that's, that's pretty shocking in the sense that A, the military was using a, a propaganda technique as, in view of our discussion today, it's not a surprise. Um, but also, it's uh, shocking that Facebook, which has been testifying in Congress about its, um, you know, its action to disrupt things and its um, its acceptance of uh, information that's divisive uh, to a, to a country, to a democracy, um, was doing that. Has been doing that in in Sudan, which is so fragile, vulnerable. And Facebook was there making things worse. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I mean, that's a, a very interesting news to me because I haven't really read that, I haven't seen that, but that's really interesting to, 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 to look at. And for me, it's even more interesting that the, uh, the, the, the military and the militias are using uh, you know, uh, social media platforms to uh, sort of um, go after, you know, you know, after people who they think uh, threat to them, particularly human rights defenders, uh, journalists, and all of that, and in in, in Sudan, um, you know, you know, you know, aside from Facebook, we have, uh, you know, the the government enacted a, a law in 2020, which is called cybersecurity law, and so um, you know, as part of that, many human rights defenders were uh, interrogated, were called for, you know, were charged for you know, writing posts on their Facebook accounts uh, that, um, critical, that are critical to government officials, primarily the militia and military leaders. And so to see this, um, uh, you know, uh, the news that you're reading to me, I think for me is super interesting. Um, on one hand, we have, uh, where does the freedom of expression, um, you know, uh, where do we put the line between the freedom of expression and, uh, you know, uh, also on, on one hand, on, on the other, limiting the, you know, the, um, the threats and all the restrictions that the military and repressive regimes, um, you know, sort of try to impose uh, on. Very troubling to find that it's but Definitely, that's very interesting. Uh, no, propaganda you know, is not necessarily true. And uh, again, in a democracy, you need to have truth and you, and, uh, of course, there's a First Amendment of right of expression, but there's also the need to keep it true. And uh, the same issue that exists in this country with Facebook, uh, 
apparently exists in other countries. Uh, we know in, in Myanmar, that was very divisive and they, and they caused uh, uh, tremendous violence in Myanmar um, or perpetuated it. And here now we find that the same kind of thing exists, uh, you know, in Africa, in uh, Sudan. So this is a global kind of issue, global phenomenon, and uh, uh, it's very disturbing. So we'll have to follow the story, Mutasim. We'll have to follow the story going forward because we can learn so much from the way, you know, things evolve in Sudan and other African countries, um, you know, to, to, to bring home here and to Absolutely. better examine and analyze our own uh, experience in democracy and to examine the risks we have to losing it. Uh, we, should, we should know what's happening in Sudan and elsewhere. Thank Absolutely. you so much for coming around, Mutasim. Thank you very much, Shay, for you know offering this platform to uh, raise awareness about what is happening in the part of the world. Thank you very much. I know we'll see you again soon. Thank Absolutely. you so much. Thank you. Take care. Aloha.